What's up everyone, it's Cody, back again with another video. This week I am going to answer the age-old question of should I use Kotlin or Java for Android app development in 2021? Now, if for some reason we have made it to the year 2022 or 2027, I want to assure you that most of my points in this video are still valid, so even if it's not 2021 anymore, feel free to keep on watching. Android was first released on September 23rd of 2008. At that time, Java was a fairly popular programming language, so it just made sense to make use of that as opposed to some other programming languages. Actually, to this day, Java is still the second most popular programming language, only being beaten by Python. So keeping that in mind, it probably makes sense to just keep using Java in 2021 for Android development, right? Wrong. There are actually a number of reasons that make Java a poor choice for Android development, and unfortunately, there are just as many number of reasons that make Kotlin an excellent choice for Android development. So I first published a fart soundboard app back in 2011. Ever since then, I have just kind of stuck with Android development, so I've been doing it for about a decade now, so I'm well versed in all of the ins and outs. Back then, I was developing applications using Java 6, which even at that time, back in 2011, that was a five-year-old version of Java. It actually wasn't until October 2013 when Android Build Tools 19 was released that we could finally do Android development with Java 7, which at that point in time, Java 7 was only two years old. Unfortunately, that is actually the last version of Java that is fully supported on Android. Today, you can enable select Java 8 features and APIs. Keep in mind that Java 8 was released back in 2014, so that's really not a great thing. The same holds true with Android 11, where you can enable select functionality of those Java 11 APIs through a feature known as desugaring. Desugaring essentially allows older versions of Android to work with those newer Java APIs, even though that version of Android did not ship with those Java APIs natively. Kotlin, on the other hand, is platform agnostic by design. That means that developers can write in Kotlin JVM, Kotlin JS, and Kotlin native. So regardless of where you want your application to run, Kotlin can support it. When you are working on Android, you will have the Kotlin JVM and the Kotlin core libraries available to you. This means you can make use of all of the new Kotlin language features and APIs as soon as they are released. And there are many, many good Kotlin language features that we will get into a little bit later on in this video. So be sure to stick around. The other advantage of Kotlin being language agnostic by design is it actually gives a reasonable path forward for doing true cross-platform develop in a totally native world. So you can start off your developer journey learning Android and Kotlin and really honing in and becoming an expert in those two specific areas, but you aren't pigeonholing yourself into just being an Android or a Kotlin developer. If you wanted to then create a iOS application, you can do so by leveraging your existing Kotlin knowledge by using Kotlin multi-platform. This will allow you to create core functionality and bundle that together, and that will be used on both Android and iOS. Then, if you have any specific needs for iOS, such as you know having UI that looks like iOS, you can use the regular iOS tooling, open up Xcode, make use of those tools, you can write Swift, which is a very, very similar language to Kotlin. There are some differences, of course. Now, if you have been doing Android development for a while now, you're probably screaming at me going, but Cody, there is Java to a Jack, Java to object, Java to ob, Java to objc. Basically, it is a framework that allows you to write Java code, and it will transpile that and convert it into Objective C code so that you can run it on iOS. Adoption for that, I don't think was very big. I think Google used it quite a bit internally for a while, but I really don't know of anyone else that was using that framework. Keep in mind that. Going from Java to Objective-C is not the same as like going from Kotlin to Swift because Objective-C is a completely different beast on its own. Syntax looks very different. It's very Smalltalk-esque. And so if you don't have experience with Smalltalk, you only have experience with Java, 
you are probably going to have a bad time using that tooling. So to understand why the future of Android is with Kotlin, we first have to understand why the future of Android is not with Java. Android's entire UI system is based on a framework that was developed over a decade ago. It was developed way back in 2008, and so we are still working with that framework today. That has been iterated on over many, many years, but the Android Frameworks tool team finally decided, hey, we can't keep iterating on this. This isn't allowing us to do actual like modern UI things that we want to do. And so they've decided to completely rewrite the UI system from the ground up. When it came time to decide on what language and what technology they were going to build this new UI framework on, the team decided to go with Kotlin because of the unique language features that allowed them to build a reactive UI system that just wouldn't be possible in any reasonable sort of way going with Java. This library is known as Jetpack Compose, and the nice thing about Jetpack Compose is it allows you to write your UI code completely in Java. This means you don't have to worry about XML anymore. You don't have to context switch between XML tags and Kotlin language or Java language. You just deal with Kotlin. It's Kotlin all the way down. And then the thing to keep in mind about why it is really nice is Compose was developed recently. And so all of those UI developments that happened back in say 2014, 2015 with material design, and then much later on with dark theming, all of those things have been taken into account and they've been built from the ground up in Jetpack Compose. Of course, because Java is so ingrained in Android, it is going to be many, many years if ever before we see Java completely go away in Android, it would really require a complete rewrite of the entire Android operating system. And I don't see that really happening, but just kind of keep that in mind that even though Java will sort of stick around, it's really not going to be a major player going forward. And then really outside of Jetpack Compose, you can even look at the open source community, which is a major reason why Android was actually successful. That open source community, they have even started to abandon Java. If you look at OKHttp, okay they've rewritten that library completely in Kotlin. It's not using Java anymore, even though it does support Java. If you are trying to look at what the source code does, it's no longer that thing of, well, you need to know Java. No, you actually need to know Kotlin. Keep that in mind, because I know that there are a lot of folks out there that will say, learn Java first, because you'll have to look at Java code. And if you don't understand what the Java code does, you're going to have a bad time. That was true a couple years ago. It's not true anymore. At this point, you really have to understand what Kotlin is doing, and you have to be able to read Kotlin to be able to be a proficient Android developer. Now, the reason why the Android team and the open source community have been moving towards Kotlin more recently is because of the language features. It's just a pleasant language to use. For starters, Kotlin's type system is broken up into nullable and non-nullable types. And by default, everything is non-nullable. So you have to opt into nullability. And I get it, at first, this may sound too restrictive having to opt into nullability. I mean, we have been dealing with null pointer exceptions for decades. We have lost billions and billions of dollars over that gosh darn null pointer exception. So at this point, I mean, we're used to dealing with null. We're used to those NPEs, right? Wrong. Since the Kotlin compiler knows whether or not something is non-null or nullable, it can actually force you to do specific non-null checks on nullable types. This means that instead of getting a runtime exception, you'll get a compilation error when you try to access a nullable field or property before checking is that thing non-null. No one likes writing if else statements to figure out is this thing null, is it not? I mean, if we did, those NPE issues would not be issues. We would just do those happily. So why would someone want to use Kotlin if it's going to force you to do all of those non-null checks? Because this is built into the language, the developers of Kotlin already thought of that. And if you want to run something on a nullable type, you can simply add a question mark before you make that call. And it will do that null check for you. If the thing is null, it won't run that function and you won't get that NPE. If you need to do some default behavior, so if you wanna do something when that thing is null, you can use what is called an Elvis operator, which is just a question mark with the colon. You can turn your head to the side, kind of looks like Elvis. And that will only execute if the thing on the left-hand side of it 
is null. Kotlin also makes creating anemic data models really, really simple. All you have to do is append data to the class that you are creating, and that one keyword will generate your to string, your hash, your equals. It will also give you a copy function, which allows you to make your data classes completely immutable. And if you ever need to make a change to that class, you can just call the copy function. Now, I would say that that data class also generates all of the get and set functions for you in Kotlin, but you actually don't need the data keyword for that. That's just the way Kotlin works. Properties just implicitly have a get and a set function depending on if they are a val, which will only give you a get function, or if they are a var, which will give you a get and set function. Of course, Java, they have this available as well in the form of a record class. That is available in Java 14, so good luck using that if you are uh, using Android. Kotlin has also had Lambda since day one. This is also something that Java has, and so for the remainder of this video, if Kotlin and Java both do the same thing, I'm just going to omit that as a language feature because both can do it. Another nice thing about Kotlin is this idea of structured concurrency. It comes in the form of coroutines. They function as extremely lightweight threads. And so this means that if you wanted to launch 1 million coroutines on your Android device, you can do so and your device will not crash. I wanna say good luck trying to launch 1 million different threads on a mobile device. Actually, good luck launching a million threads on your computer. It's probably gonna lock up and crash because threads are pretty heavy. This idea of structured concurrency also comes with similar compiler checks. So if you want to have something that is going to be a coroutine, you can define it as a suspending function. And that means that it can only ever be called from another suspending function or from a coroutine itself. If you try to call it anywhere else, you will not be able to compile. This is really good because it also solves for common threading mistakes. This doesn't necessarily prevent you from locking up your main thread, but it does make it much more difficult. You almost have to opt into that. And then it's really hard to talk about Kotlin without talking about how concise the language is. We already talked about nullability, so I won't bore you on that. The first thing is just about everything related to control flow in Kotlin is actually evaluated as an expression. This means that whenever you have an if else statement, if you have a try catch block, if you have a when statement, which is the equivalent of a switch case statement, you can actually set a variable equal to whatever the last line was on that control flow statement. This means you can set a if else statement to be equal to the result of either the if or the else. You can do the same thing for a try catch block. And yes, you can do the same thing for those when statements. And so this may not seem like a big deal at first, but just think about the Java alternative. First, you have to instantiate a variable, and then from within any of those blocks, you have to then actually set that variable. It also makes it much more difficult to have things that are immutable. So since you're able to set the thing once, you can make the outcome of that if else, that try catch statement, a immutable val, and then you know that that value will never change for the rest of that scope. The language also has type inference. This means if you are defining a variable and you are setting the value immediately, you don't have to tell the compiler what type it is. It already knows what type it is based on what value you are setting on it. Then there is smart casting, which allows you to automatically typecast anything once you know what type that is. I honestly forgot that this wasn't a feature of Java and anytime I go back and have to write some Java code, it's kind of frustrating having to first check the type, make sure it is an instance of this thing, and then after that, even though I know it is an instance of that thing, I have to typecast it. It's annoying. It's really great that Kotlin allows you to do that in a single line. Kotlin also has support for extension functions and extension properties. These essentially allow you to remove the utils class and because you're writing those extension functions and properties on top of an existing class, that means if you're doing something on a string, you don't have to pass a string into a utils function. You just call that function on the string as if that function already existed on the string and always has. Kotlin is an amazing language and this video really just scratches the surface of all of the different features that are available to it. If you aren't already using Kotlin in 2021, I would highly recommend learning it, especially if you are doing mobile development. I've created several courses on YouTube to learn Kotlin, so I'll leave links to all of those courses down in the description below. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to smash the like button for the YouTube algorithm 
and share it with one of your friends or coworkers that really just loves Java and they hate Kotlin, just share it with them. Then if you aren't subscribed already, don't forget to do that. Also be sure to click the notification bell so you get notifications anytime I upload a new video like this one. We also have a growing Discord community. It is again, completely free to join. Link to that will be in the description below as well. Feel free, join, come hang out with us, come chat about programming, chat about gaming, whatever. That's it. That's the video. Thanks so much for watching and I will catch you in the next one.